CD1. IELTS for Academic Purposes. Six Practice Tests. By Malcolm Mann and Steve Taylor Knowles. Published by McGraw Hill, 2009. All rights reserved. Test 1. You will hear a number of different recordings and you'll have to answer questions on what you hear. There'll be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you'll have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you'll be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You'll hear a head teacher and a teacher discussing a school camping trip. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. You'll see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning, Mr Thompson. Can I speak to you for a moment? Of course, Jamie. Come in. Have a seat. I've just finished looking through the reports for this term. It looks like the pupils are doing very well. Mr. Thompson says he's just finished looking through the reports, so B has been circled. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good morning, Mr. Thompson. Can I speak to you for a moment? Of course, Jamie. Come in. Have a seat. I've just finished looking through the reports for this term. It looks like the pupils are doing very well. Yes, I think they are. It's all going fine. So, Jamie, what's on your mind? Well, I've been thinking about next month's camping trip, the one for year 10. Yes, we've got it scheduled for the 23rd to the 26th, if I'm not mistaken. Ah, uh, actually, I think it's the 24th to the 27th. Let's just check. Oh, right. Yes, yes, you're right. So... Well, I've been thinking about how we might possibly make this year's event even better than last year's. Not that last year's wasn't great, but... Suggestions for improvement are always welcome, Jamie. So, what have you been thinking about? Well, to tell the truth, I wasn't completely happy with the camp we used last year. It was rather small, and I didn't feel that the grounds were particularly well kept. Go on. I did some searching, and I think I found the perfect spot. It's called Shepton Meadows, and... Is that the campsite in the Lake District? No. Actually, it's just outside Carlisle. It's a huge site, and it's on a lovely lake, Lake Brant, I believe it's called. Half the site is forested, and the rest, the actual camping area, is grassy. For kids that rarely get to see anything more than concrete, it's ideal. And the facilities are amazing. There's a basketball court, a large pool and a football pitch. There are well-marked trails through the forest for hiking and the lake is there for swimming and other water sports. I believe there's even a lifeguard service. That sounds like it might suit our purposes perfectly. Did you happen to find out about availability and cost? Yes, as a matter of fact, I did. I called them yesterday evening and there are plenty of spots available. And because we're a non-profit organisation, they said they would give me a reduction in the price. If I remember correctly, we paid £5 a head last year. Yes, per night, right? Yes, each child paid £10 for the two nights. Well, at this campsite, it's only £4 per night. And they told me that if we had over 50 children, which we do, they could give us a further 10% off. That's very reasonable, isn't it? Well, from what you've told me, I think we should probably go ahead and book. Excellent. I'm sure the children will love it. I'm sure they will. 
Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, Jamie, have you given any thought to an itinerary by any chance? As a matter of fact, I have. Wait one second. Yes, here it is. I've made a few notes. OK, so, now, these are just ideas, of course. Yes, yes, go on. Let's hear what you've got. Right. We time it so that we arrive at the camp around 7 on Friday evening. It'll still be light then and we'll have plenty of time to set up camp and get ourselves settled in. At 8, we could have a barbecue, you know, hamburgers and hot dogs, something that's nice and easy to prepare. And that children love. Yes. Then lights out would be at 9.30 so the children will get a good night's sleep and be up bright and early at 7 on Saturday morning. Breakfast would be at 7.30, an hour's hiking from 8 till 9, and then a couple of hours at the lake. That would take us up to 11. I think that an hour of free time would then be in order. Let them have a chance to explore a bit on their own, you know? Yes, great idea. And then? Let's see, a picnic lunch at 12, and then sports in the afternoon till 4. Another swim until 5, and then supper. After clean-up, around 6.30, we could have a talk-back session where the children get a chance to discuss their day and anything else they might have on their minds. Then a campfire and sing-along at 8, back to the tents at 9.30, and, well, that takes care of Saturday. Excellent. Excellent. That would certainly keep them busy. What about Sunday? Sunday, right. As on Saturday, same wake-up and breakfast times, and then I thought we could go on a bit of a day trip. There are some caves about an hour's walk from the camp, which I thought the children might find interesting. We could leave at eight, which would mean we'd get to the caves at nine. They could explore for a couple of hours, and we'd head back at eleven. Twelve o'clock would see us back at the meadows. An hour's swim, and then lunch at one. Then we could have organised games in the afternoon until supper at five. It would take us an hour to clean up our sights and pack up. We'd be on the buses at six and all set to head back into the city. Well now, you've certainly put a lot of thought into this, Jamie, and it's paid off. I think it sounds wonderful. I can't think of a thing that needs to be changed. Let's go for it. Brilliant. I'll get the itinerary printed up and put it up on the notice board this afternoon. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You'll hear a guide talking to visitors about a tourist attraction. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Roman Baths. My name's Amanda and I'm your guide for today. Before we begin the tour, I'd like to point out that we have child carriers, free of charge, of course, for those of you with young children. And I can see that there are one or two of you here this morning. It might make things a bit easier for you than using a pushchair. 
If you don't want to carry your coats and bags around with you, there is a cloakroom behind reception where they'll be quite safe. Also, should anyone want to use the bathroom, there's one here in the reception hall, opposite the ticket office, and another one by the shop where we end our tour, right by the exit. Having mentioned the shop, I should tell you that it's full of interesting things for you to remember your visit by. Posters, postcards, replicas of the Gorgon's head, the Haruspex stone and the statues that you'll be seeing on your tour. There are also games, books and videos for children and other souvenirs. Our first stop will be the terrace, where you will get your first view of the baths. Now the statues that line the terrace here are of Roman emperors, governors of Britain and various military leaders. These aren't from Roman times either. In fact, they were sculpted in 1894, especially for the grand opening of the baths in 1897. But what you can see from here is only a fraction of the whole Roman bath site, which stretches below ground level under the surrounding streets and squares of the town. While we're here on the terrace, getting our first look at the baths, let me fill you in on a bit of the history. This site, with its hot springs, has long been seen as a sacred place, and the first people to build here were the Celts, and the shrine they built was dedicated to the goddess Sulis. Of course, back in those days, they had no way of explaining how hot water came to be bubbling out of the ground, so they believed it to be the work of the gods. When the Romans came, they too built a temple here and dedicated it to their goddess, Minerva. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. The bath you can see from here is called the Great Bath. Not very imaginative, I know, but it is the biggest. Impressive, isn't it? At one time it was housed in a huge vaulted hall 40 metres high, which for many people of the period must have been the largest building they'd ever seen in their lives. The bath itself is 1.6 metres deep, ideal for bathing, and has steps leading down to the water on all sides. The niches or alcoves you can see all around the bath would have had benches and possibly small tables for drinks and snacks. Not a bad way to spend your free time, relax and tell yourself it's all good for your health. Let's move on to our next stop, the Sacred Spring. This is the heart of the site, where the hot water bubbles up from the ground at a temperature of 46 degrees centigrade. The water comes up from a depth of between roughly 2,500 and 4,500 metres, where geothermal energy raises the water temperature to between 64 degrees and 96 degrees. Over a million litres of this hot water rise up here every day. And as well as being hot, the water is rich in minerals, and it was thought it would cure various ailments and illnesses. In fact, people came here from all over the Roman Empire to try out its healing powers. Before we take a look at the changing rooms and saunas, which are known as the East Baths, and the plunge pools and heated rooms of the west part of the bathhouse, we'll pass through the site of the temple and the temple courtyard, here we are. This temple is one of only two known classical Roman temples in Britain. The other is the Temple of Claudius at Colchester. This temple is said to date from the late 1st century AD, being built between 60 and 70 AD. But the original temple has been knocked about and added to over the centuries, and what you can see here are just bits of the original temple. OK? Shall we move on? That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You'll hear two university students discussing a social science lecture they attended. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Did you go to the first social science lecture yesterday? Yeah. Didn't you see me there? No. I was trying so hard to understand the lecturer. What didn't you understand? A lot of it, really. For example, he said we needed to study history as part of the course, but I didn't get why. You probably missed it. He said early on that we need to learn from our past mistakes. Right. But he also said we need to put ourselves in the place of our ancestors. Why is that? I think the point is that it's not enough to know how they lived and what they did. We need to know what they thought. I see. And I've written transferable skills in my notes next, but I have no idea what that means. If you study social science, you learn skills that you can use in a job. Oh, right. Is that all? Okay, but why is that? The point he made was that in studying social science, you use a flexible and adaptable approach to learning. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. He also kept mentioning all the other subjects we will need to study as part of the course. I didn't write them all down, did you? Some of them. I think I can make sense of my notes. The first one was anthropology, which he said would cover prehistory and archaeology as well. Okay. Then there's economics. I wrote down that this was not meant to mean that we will spend all our time looking at economic theory, but more that we need to see how humans behave. That's good. I don't think I could handle economic theory. He said something about education too, didn't he? Yeah. He said we'll be looking at how cultural information is handed down from one generation to the next through teaching children. He said we'd be focusing on geography, too, but I can't really remember which aspects. Can you? I noted it down, I think. Here we are, yes, particularly in relation to urban planning. It's law that I got confused about. I didn't understand why he linked that to economics. I think he meant that laws affect the way wealth is distributed. That makes sense. Now, what are the science wars? Okay, I did get that. The science wars are about how social science collects information. In sociology and social work, and in social science generally, they can only study patterns of behavior and observe. If you compare that to the way scientists work in physics or chemistry, it's very different because they use specific experiments that can be tested and which give concrete answers. Social studies is often accused of being unscientific. That's all. Okay. But it still looks like a good course, doesn't it? You don't have any regrets, do you? None at all. I'm looking forward to it. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You'll hear a lecturer talking to students about sport in Ireland. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 33. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 33. Now today we're going to be finding out about the most popular sports in the Emerald Isle. That's Ireland, of course. Can you guess what they are? Well, there are these two lesser played games, a form of rounders and Gaelic handball. But we'll start with one which is perhaps over 3,000 years old arriving in Ireland with the Celts, some claim. That may be a slight exaggeration, but I consider it to be the fastest field game in the world, and it goes by the name of hurling. Well, that's what it's known as in the English-speaking world anyway. So, what do you have to do? You've got 15 players on a team, one of them the goalkeeper. Each one has a stick called a hurley. Here you are. I've brought mine along. Had it since I was at school. This is what it looks like, and basically you have to get this ball, called a schlitter, that's S-L-I-O-T-A-R, so it's not spelt the way it's pronounced. You hit it into the net for three points, or you can hit it over the net for one point. The goal looks like the letter H, with the net under the crossbar. The goalie has a bigger stick than the others to help keep the ball out. You can also catch the schlitter and run with it for four steps maximum or bounce it on your stick. Is that clear to you all? I'll be showing you a video a bit later so you can see what a game actually looks like. You might like to think of it as a mixture of lacrosse, hockey and baseball. Oh, and it's played by women too but it goes by the name of Kamogi in that case. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 34 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 34 to 40. I'll give you a bit of the history, shall I now? Generally, the golden age of the game is considered to be the 18th century. But systematic rules were first agreed and drawn up at that great shrine of learning, Trinity College Dublin, in 1879, founding the Irish Hurling Union closely followed just a few years later by the formation of the Gaelic Athletics Association. With greater organisation last century, the All-Ireland Hurling Championship got off to a flying start, and I'm proud to say that my own native city of Cork has won more than 20 titles over the years. But then, so have Kilkenny and Tipperary. Is it only played in Ireland? No. Well, it is the only country with a national team at the moment, but you may be surprised to discover there are hurling clubs in London, as well as in America and Argentina, to name just a few. The other game I'd like to take a little time to introduce you to is Gaelic football, which is played on the same pitch as hurling with the same number of players, but there's no net. You just have to get the ball over your opponent's goalposts and you can do that by kicking or punching the ball. However, you're not supposed to do that to the players, I might add. Imagine it as a combination of soccer and basketball, but in my opinion, it's a more exciting spectacle than either of those. Excuse my bias, if you will. It's also very popular with women. In fact, there are more women's teams than for any other sport, 
whether despite or because of the physical contact involved, I wouldn't like to say. They do play a shorter game, 60 minutes, rather than the men's 70. So, let's have a look. If we can have the lights down, I'll see if I can get this technology to work. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet.